Well, it's such an extraordinary collection of Lamborghinis here. It's be crazy not to give you a sort of guided tour through the history of Lamborghini. And this is where it started. This is Ferrocio Lamborghini's first car, and it's the 350 GT. So a front engine, three and a half litre V12, two-seater car, coupe, quite an elegant car. They actually drive much sported than perhaps they look, but it's, I mean, it's a GT car and it's whether, there's always this myth of whether Ferruccio Lamborghini had this uh, uh, Ferrari 330 he wasn't satisfied with and he was going to make a better car. So that's where it started. But boy, did we move on from this point. Because after the 350 GT and the 400 GT came this, the Lamborghini Miura just shocked the world when they showed it, all in these vibrant uh, colours like this. This is actually an S, it's not the very first one, but it's very, very similar to it because it's, you can see, the, the wheels are slightly inset. That's how you tell the early cars. It's a completely different car to the uh, 350 GT because this mid-engined V12, four litre, it revs to 8,000 RPM. No one had ever seen a car like this. This was really the start of the supercar era. But the style of it, that's what everybody loves about the Miura, which to this day, is there a more beautiful car? Just so you start with the early car, when we have a look what happens next, there's smaller wheels on this, and you tell the early cars, because of these eyelashes around the headlights, very intricate. These are all steel and individually numbered, and they're a nightmare when you're restoring a car, when you're trying to find this, all this correct metalwork and getting it absolutely perfect. Let's move on to what happened after this car. So after the 400S came this, the SV, the Mura SV, the ultimate Mura. And you can tell the difference between the two cars because now they've grown the rear wheel arch here and you can see the bigger wheels on it. This is 375 horsepower now. We started at about 325 horsepower. 375 for this one, the ultimate Mura road going. I think it's absolutely stunning. This particular example is a UK car, and I've known this car for several years. It's been in restoration. He bought it, and he thought he'd just taken it in for a simple service, and then it grew and grew. And he actually bought, when he bought it, it was red, and then they took the windscreen out as they were going to repaint it and discovered this colour underneath. So this is its original colour, and it's actually just one of the concourse top prize in the SV. The other difference on a SV is it has a bigger air intake in the sill here, just feeding air around the back of the engine and into the wheel arch for the brakes. What's crazy about Lamborghini is while they're doing this incredible Mura SV, they had other cars they were producing, one of them being the four-seater Espada, totally different. Let's go and have a look at one of those. And here it is. This is actually an S2 version, which I can tell because it's got the spinners, the same wheels as the Miura. Uh, two plus two configuration, really a lot of space, and one of the balmiest looking cars I think Lamborghini ever produced, but incredibly popular. They actually sold around 1,200 of these, so way more than Miura. And it just, it's a sense that Lamborghini had these two completely different cars within their portfolio. There is the next version after this is called the S3, and it's a bit of a shame because it's, it, it, it's had to uh, comply with certain American legislation and the design purity was gone. But this was a period, 7071, when the designers would just had free reign, they could produce anything. And this is a very good example. In the early 70s, things were going pretty well for Lamborghini. It had the Espada and the Amura. And the engineer behind those cars, a chap called Bob Wallace, a New Zealander, and he had a real passion for racing. The unfortunate thing, that passion for racing was not shared with Ferruccio Lamborghini, who was absolutely insistent that Lamborghini would never go racing. But Bob Wallace wanted to prove that they could go racing. And what you see here is the Miura Jota. Now this is a pet project of Bob Wallace, after hours, to show what he could do with a Miura, how he could turn it into a race car. It's a pretty hard call to turn into a Miura into a race car because it's not the stiffest chassis. But this is, this is the result. They built one, a customer wanted to uh, drive it, and wanted, he, he really wanted to buy it and build some more, and they gave it to a dealer who then was going to deliver it to the customer, and he crashed it on the way there, and nothing survived except the engine block. And this car was being built up, this particular example, was built out about 20 years ago from the original team who made that original Yota. Quite an amazing car. It's actually done the tour, so this has done 650 miles round Italy. It's a one-off and absolutely spectacular. After the skunk works that produced the Yota came this, also from Bob Wallace, this crazy car, front engine V12 Yama. 
So this is completely stripped out. It's another pet project for this crazy engineer, Bob Wallace, who just wanted to do these race cars. So this is like a hill climb special. Um, this is a one-off. I've never seen it before in my life, and it's a real opportunity to see it. Super lightweight. The Yama was a shorter coupe version of the Espada. So a very different car from both the Mule, but all of the same period. We're all talking about the early 70s here. But it's actually, what was cooking in their works was a really spectacular car, the Kuntash. And here it is. I mean, the Kuntash shocked everyone, just like the Mura had done a few years earlier. And it's not hard to see why. This, the Kuntash was shown in concept form in 1971. The first production car was delivered in 74. And that was the, it was actually the LP400. This is actually the S version, which came a little later, about, um, eight, uh, sorry, 77 or thereabouts. And that dis was distinguished because it had these great colossal tires, three, four, five section tires. I'd love to show you the early LP400, but unfortunately it's the one car missing from this huge collection of Lamborghinis. There was one on the tour, and he unfortunately nerfed another car and it's got destroyed the front of it. But what a spectacular car, as I say. What's different with this, this has the Mura engine in it, same as the SV engine, but they got this super low deck. When we have a look at the Mura engine, you saw the carburettors were pointing out the top. On this, on the Kuntash, they put the carburettors at the side so they could actually get this view in out the back. It actually reduced the power. So when they announced the LP400, they said, oh, it's got the 375 horsepower, same as the Mura SV. And when the S came out, it was actually lower power, it's 353, because they actually put it on the dyno and realized it didn't actually produce with those tires, or with those carburettors. I still can't get over the, uh, the design of this car. 40 years old and just look at it. What a design it is. But one of the things people don't realize with these early Kuntash is they're even lower than the later cars. So this internally in the Kuntash clans is known as the low roof example. So the 400 and 400S. And what we move to next, arrived in 1981, is the 5000S. And not only did it have a bigger engine, a 4.7 litre engine, they actually increased the cockpit size by about 30 mil. And they, you can't tell until you put them side by side, but the angle of the front screen is slightly more tipped up. All the doors are slightly bigger. But the thing about the Kuntash, Bob Wallace wanted this to be a racing car. So the whole chassis on a Kuntash is actually tubular metal, beautifully done, like a birdcage Maserati or something like that. And all the suspension is all done with rose joints. It's one of the very few road cars with pure race car suspension. There's eight rose joints on each corner of the rear tires, six on the front. Very, very different to the Miura. This is a super stiff chassis that really could go racing. I just want to show you the engine on this example because this actually won its class at this concourse today. You don't often find as tidy an engine bay as that in a 5000S. It's beautifully prepared. It's all been around the rally, so it's done around a thousand miles, but just look at that for a most perfect engine bay. Well, a slight panic here because we suddenly got waved away. There we are walking around all the cars trying to do the history and suddenly we now have to leave with the factory. So we press the pause button and get up to San Agatha in this incredible convoy of uh, 320 Lamborghinis between Bologna and the factory. Police outriders are out there, lots of noise. We're, unfortunately, we're a bit late leaving, but we'll get there as soon as we can. It's very much VW money. Just brilliant. Or next to this, no? Yeah. Might as well put it next to the Lamborghinis. Okay, well, we're now at the Lamborghini factory. Sorry about the interruption. We'll continue with the history. And very conveniently, the next car in line after the Kuntash 5000S is this, the Kuntash QV. And this is a real step jump in horsepower in, in Kuntash land. Previously, we had a, a 375 horsepower engine, and it was, it was the last of the line of the Mura engine. But this is a completely different design, and the QV, or Quattro Valve, stands for four valve per cylinder. Um, and they changed the carburettors as well. And this is why you've got this hump, very recognizable. This is the sort of power dome because underneath, I'll lift this up. You see, instead of having the carburettors at the side, they're now downdraft carburettors. 
And this big change, this much better breathing of the four valve head and the carburettors pushed the power from 375 to 455 horsepower on this example. I'm told Valentino Balboni did actually tell me some of them were actually producing near 475, 480 horsepower. And the big change with this engine, they knew they had to do something because back at Ferrari, they had the Testarossa coming, they'd heard it, and they knew it was still in development and they needed something really special for their aging Countach, because this thing had been in production when this came out in 85. Oh, it's about 10, 11 years, so it was aging. They needed something special and it really delivered the goods. This was dramatically faster than any other Countach before it because of the horsepower it got. And there was, yeah, there's a famous test in the UK, uh, Tony Dron, and they managed to get a two way average of 190 miles an hour. Everybody's a bit suspicious whether that was really right, but it's having driven both cars, there's a big difference. Something I haven't discussed is if we look at this one is the wing. You often see a wing on the back of a Countach. Mine actually came with a wing in the first instance. And Valentino was telling me about this wing, the story behind it. There was a chap called Walter Wolf. He had an F1 team, Wolf Racing, um, in the 70s. He had, a, he had one of the early 400S. And he put one of the wings off his F1 cars on his Countach. And it looked like this. And everybody said, oh, that's amazing. And one of the guys who thought it looked amazing was the producer of the film Cannonball. And he says, that's the car we're going to use in my film Cannonball. So they got one. Lamborghini said, but the wing is being put on by a customer. And they said, don't worry, it looks too cool. We want one of those cars. And as soon as it appeared in the film, of course, every other customer of a new Countach wanted a wing as well. So Lamborghini had to set a factory up to produce these wings, but they never homologated it because the last thing a Countach actually needs is a wing on the rear because if it suffers from anything, it's got lift at the front. And you put a wing on the back, which is further behind the rear wheels, you just get more lift at the front. So Lamborghini made sure that this did nothing. All it adds is drag. So they reckon it reduces the top speed by about 15, 16 miles an hour. So it's a pure vanity object. I mean, it looks super cool. Who having, a, you know, because it's effectively an F1 wing. But I took it off my car because I just couldn't cope with this thing that actually sort of dominates the design, does absolutely nothing apart from slowing you down by 15, 16 miles an hour. Anyway, after the QV came the anniversary. We're going to have a look at one of those down here. We're just on our way to where the anniversary is, but I thought I'd show you this one because I didn't realise this one was here. This is quite rare. This is um, what they did for the US. So this is the Quattro valve, but it's injection. And you'll notice that it's completely different on the top. It has a different top to the engine cover because, as the name suggests, carburettors can no longer pass US reg uh, regulations by the late 80s. So they had to do this injection model. Slightly lower horsepower, it's about 420 horsepower thereabouts. Very smooth running. They're quite well liked these cars. They just don't quite have that punch and obviously don't have the pops and bangs that the carburettor versions like mine sort of produce all the time. And you can also tell them because the exhaust come out vertically rather than sort of pointing upwards. That's getting a bit anoraki. So I better stop there and we'll move on to the anniversary. Well, we're still looking for the elusive anniversary uh, Countach. There's another variant I'll just show you here for true Countach anoraks. This is called the 88 and a half. And you can tell an 88 and a half because of these side sills. Instead of having the sills that sort of wrap round, they've got these ones with the straights to feed extra air into the rear wheel arch and to sort of help cool the brakes and things. Very rare, about um, 15, 16 right-hand drive cars like that. Anyway, we'll continue looking for the anniversary. Right, found it. Here it is, Kunchash Anniversary, built for celebrate their 25 years of um, Lamborghini. And it's quite different, as you can see. It's basically the Quattro valve. Mechanically, it's, it's near identical. There is rumour, and that's all it is, that it's slightly wider track, slightly different than the rear suspension. But fundamentally, it's the, the still the Quattro valve with the carburetor dome, etc. But what's changed? They've added this crash structure. And it's, it's really quite sad because it's such a statement on the Countach, those big that sort of rear lights and the flat front. And they had to build in a bumper as well that be, went beyond the exhaust pipes. And also, this always, while they thought, well, while we're about it, we'll just have a look at the cooling of it. And so they added these strakes here, this completely different air box, because the vertical radiators are here, and just a vent air out as well, and a vent more, a bit more air out of the engine bay. And it sort of didn't really help the looks. It, nobody says it's really their favourite Countach. The sad 
Well, the fact is, behind all this, this is the most sorted Kuntash of them all. And it's one of those little sleepers sitting in the classifiers. I do wonder if some people are going to either clean these up and make it look like a quattro valve or continue the anniversary because it's the most sorted Kuntash out there. And therefore, it should actually be one of the favourite because it's one of the best to drive. Now, this sort of finished, the last one was built in 1990, and then another sea change happened at Lamborghini, which we'll get to next. And here we are, we get to the Lamborghini Diablo. Big changes here. Engine grew from 5.2 in the contrast of 5.7 litres here. Horsepower, 500 horsepower. And it's actually a bigger car altogether. Again, the safety regulations were coming in. The Countach, you've got to remember, was actually arrived in 71, shown in concept form, first customer 74. So it had lived a long life, but this was their new sports car. This was Lamborghini's future. And it, it's, it's one of the big changes with it. Obviously it's longer, it's a bit wider. It's quite a lot heavier. It hasn't got that delicacy in the chassis that the Countach had. Uh, but it added, as we'll see in later iterations, it, it went on and became a pretty special car. Really dramatic forward cabin design, the sloping uh, glass on it, bringing, coming down, the, you're sitting really forward, that big V12 at the back. No power steering, which is just a nightmare on these cars, and this big dashed binnacle. You can almost have to peer over it when you have a look inside. Really heavy clutch as well. Um, quite a brutish car. It was. I really loved the design of it, but it was it was quite hard work to drive this. But they had lots of things up the sleeve as we'll get to and we'll have a look at some of the other cars. But this was a big revolution for Lamborghini when the Diablo arrived in 1991. So after the Diablo arrival in 1991, Lamborghini didn't make many changes until 93, and this arrived on the back of your Lamborghini. VT. VT was viscous coupling and it was the four-wheel drive system Lamborghini introduced to harness all that horsepower generated from the 5.7 litre engine. They also made some other changes, they put power steering on and revised the dash, set the dash lower. But there's a really exciting car they had in the wings, the SE30, and that comes next. Another anniversary model of the SE30, 30 years of Lamborghini now, and they knew that the Diablo was suffering a bit because it was quite heavy. It was the one thing over the Countach it gained about 200 kilos or thereabouts. So this was their attempt to make a lighter weight Diablo. And it's a pretty, they, it's pretty extreme really. They did away, for example, the electric windows are gone. All you got was these little tiny electric lights here, just plastic windows here. That's all you got is ventilation. Air conditioning went, it went back to two wheel drive. No power steering and uh, the engine was increased to 530 horsepower. So a real hardcore sort of race car, this car. And 28 were converted to Yota spec. And you can spot those, this one isn't one, but they have air intakes here. And they were just pure race car. They were up to close to 595 horsepower from the 5.7 litre engine. So a very extreme car indeed. I mean, this is pretty mental, this one. I haven't seen any Jotas here, but perhaps we'll find them. Right. So we're in 94 here, let's move to 95. Okay, now we're in 95 and one of my favourite Diablos arrives. This is the Diablo SV and they again had a rethink of what the Diablo should be and just made it a bit more sporty but actually made it less expensive as well, which is a rare combination. So the SV got, still had the 5.7 litre engine, 517 horsepower, but they made it a bit lighter. It's a bit stripped out inside and they had shorter gearing. They did away with trying to chase 200 miles an hour. So it's more accelerative. And then it also has this great engine top, which is from the Jota Sports. So you have these two intakes sort of peering over top of the cabin. And I have to say, this is still a sleeper in the classified, but it's my tip for the top. Diablo SV, superb driving machine, two wheel drive, a really good Diablo and underrated. Well, the late 90s was a really quite exciting time in Lamborghini's history because in 98, VW bought Lamborghini and they really started to invest in the brand. And also the Diablo had another sort of midlife reshape. It had these new lights, they're having pop-up lights. It actually got these lights. It gave it a bit of a face and it also got a revised dash inside. And straight after, this is a, one of the last SVs made, is how you recognise these lights. But straight after this, a really exciting Diablo arrived. And there's one over here I want to show you. Now we get to the Diablo GT, which is basically that Diablo SV on drugs. You can see it's completely different the front, this sort of section here, so it really feeds the radiator in the front. But the big change here, the engine grows from 5.7 litre to 6 litres, 575 horsepower, 
carbon everything. They really try to lighten this car. They only produced 80 of these monsters, and they were true monsters to drive with that amount of horsepower going through the rear wheels. Huge, great scoops above the cockpit as well. A very, very special car and very collectible today. So after the SV and the GT in 99 came this. This is, it came, arrived in 2000. This is the six litre Diavolo. So it gets the same six litre engine as we saw in the GT, introducing the GT. Slightly down tuned to 550 horsepower. Four wheel, four wheel drive is back, but it's just the influence of VW Audi. They're really upping the quality of Lamborghini. And this one really surprised us when we first drove this car. This was a very polished Diavolo, and today are very sought after. And it's dead easy to understand why, because it sort of looks super clean but really does drive very nicely. So after the six litre Diablo comes a big change. There's a new designer in at Lamborghini, Luke Donkervolt, and a brand new look for Lamborghini. And here we are, the arrival of the Murcielago, a completely reskinned Diablo. A really good design, Luke Donkervolt did the design. And when you think there's nothing really different under the skin, I think it looks so, it looks terrific because it looks so different to the Diablo, but looks modern and fresh and definitely Lamborghini. Luke Donkervolt said to me that he was teased by Valentino. He said, oh, did you like, he asked Valentino if he liked the design. And he came back, he says, it's the mechanicals that matter on a, on a Lamborghini. You just designed the engine cover. And so it's all sort of a slight put down, but I I think it was a great design. I'll show you some of the key sort of design features that made this car look so different to the Diablo. First of all, you have the projector headlights at the front, the rear, this sort of very clean sweep and this huge intake coming in at the bottom there with an oil cooler behind it, sort of subtle badging. And, and this was air intakes that sort of came, rose up and went down again, just much tidier around the back. Later additions like this one, it became optional to have glass over the engine to expose the engine. The engine was grew again, 6.2 litre, 575 horsepower. Big difference this car, but a really great looking car. Just a thoroughly sorted modern design. In 2004, they did a roadster version. The other thing that was important on this one, introduced the paddle shift. So you have a manual or a paddle shift Murcielago. And this went on to 2004 when they did a, a, a mid, midlife facelift and we got to the LP640. And I'll see if I can find one of those for you. We're now in 2006, Murcielago has its major facelift and we get to this, the LP640, and a really exciting car. I thought, again, the, the design moved on. You can rec instantly recognisable by a giant exhaust at the rear. I describe it, it's like a rabbit hole. It's, you just think people, animals could live down there. It's so big at the back. The other changes were even wider scoops down on the sill here. And then this big upgrade it gets its name 640 because it's 640 PS, so 635 horsepower thereabouts. Really quick car, still four wheel drive. And just also at the front, it's more aerodynamic at the front, more aggressive at the front. I think it's a great looking car, this one. But we go on to one more special edition after this. That's the crowning glory of the Murcielago, and it's over there. I know we arrive in 2009 and Lamborghini wows us again with the LP674 SV. What a crazy nutter machine this one is. 6.5 litre again, but 670 horsepower. Lightened as carbon fire here, there and everywhere on this. This monster rear wing, it's optional actually. Different treatment on the rear over the engine. Massive scoops at the front. I mean, just a wild looking machine. Lamborghini at its best. And still today, this is, a, I think, is a very collectible car. And people who own them have just absolutely adored them. So the 670 is the end of the line of the Mercilago. But what a way to go out. But when we see what happens next, that's pretty special too. A new chapter for Lamborghini. The Aventador arrived brand new from head to toe, all carbon construction, 6.5 litre engine, 700 horsepower, four wheel drive, and the design as wild as we have just loved from Lamborghini. I think it's the most dramatic design. You think this is the start of a new chapter. We don't know where this is going to go, but what a starting point. Been hugely popular, still got a waiting list now in 2013. And I think it's been great fun to go around this car park while, while this 50th anniversary is on to see every single iteration of the V12 Lamborghini. You've come all the way from the 350 GT to the Aventador. That's Lamborghini's history in a nutshell. How much, I've tried to wrap it up as tight as I can and now it's time for a beer.